childhood is supposed to be safe, a time of learning, exploring, and fun. In Rochester, New York, in the early 1970s, it was not always fun to be a child, and it was not always safe. I've got a five-year-old daughter of my own, and I don't feel now that it's safe to let her go outside and play anymore. So you're going to leave? Sure am. Especially, it was potentially dangerous to be a grade school girl, 10 or 11 years old, alone on the streets of Rochester at dusk. There is reason to believe Michelle was picked up outside that supermarket. In just two years, three young Rochester girls vanished from busy neighborhoods as night fell. Days later, their lifeless bodies were found in rural areas outside the city limits. They had been sexually assaulted, strangled, and discarded. I uh, told the class at the end of the day's session about her, and I think her classmates are, are going to miss her very much. The similarities between the three victims were striking. All three were from poor Catholic families. Even among their own peers, all three lacked friends. All three were just blocks from home when someone took them away. Perhaps the first thing that one comes to grips with is that you wonder how terrible a mind could anybody possess that would lead him to doing a thing of this kind. For 30 years, Rochester police could never answer that question. Three little girls died, and no one knows who killed them or why. Against all odds, criminal profiler Roy Hazelwood will now take on the case. What kind of person would have committed this crime in this way for these reasons. In a three-decade career with the FBI, the Texas native Hazelwood helped pioneer the science of profiling violent sexual predators, a unique discipline that blends intuition, psychology, and old-fashioned gumshoe dedication. When you deal with a sexual offender, he tends to evidence parts of his desires and parts of his motivation through the way he commits the crime. And so that's why it's so important to analyze every aspect of his crime. Roy, this is uh, the boxes of evidence. Hazelwood travels to Rochester to begin his investigation. Captain Lynn Johnston of the Rochester Police Department hands over 30 years of materials related to the unsolved case. I wanted autopsy reports, crime scene photographs, autopsy photographs. I wanted crime scene sketches, and I wanted crime scene investigative reports. There is also a type of information Hazelwood does not want. So I think I'll find everything you need. Uh, Absolutely. Suspect information. Yeah, I don't suspect. want any, no, inf no suspect information. No, we'll take it out of the boxes. I appreciate sure that. The reason we don't accept access to suspect information is because then we may begin to bias our opinions toward a person or a particular type of person. Hazelwood must see the crimes fresh as he searches for overlooked clues that may have kept the killer of three young girls at large for nearly 30 years. Next, at his home base in Northern Virginia, Hazelwood calls together several colleagues from the Academy Group, an elite profiling agency. Each member has decades of experience in the psychology of violent crime. I selected three of my colleagues in the Academy Group. Ken Baker, retired Secret Service. Ken Lanning, who recently retired from the FBI Academy. And Steve Martigian, who recently retired from the FBI Academy. Expertly trained in deduction and crime scene analysis, Hazelwood's team will pore over the most intricate, intimate details of the three unsolved slayings. The yes. abduction sites are similar. They were in close proximity to one another. Yes, they were. And they were dumped in, uh, in, in rural, 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 unpopulated sites. areas. They will set aside all previously held theories, turning time and distance into investigative allies. With these abducted and missing children cases, you have to be very careful to assess and evaluate the information that you get from anybody. This will be Roy Hazelwood's mandate and mission on behalf of Rochester law enforcement authorities to search for new information and, above all, answers. How the killer of three little girls has thus far escaped justice, who he is, and why he did it. The nightmare for the city of Rochester began with a little girl who herself had nightmares. Her name was Carmen Colon. From the beginning, Carmen had been dealt a difficult hand. Her parents could not be located for an interview, but her cousin, Angel Cologne, 
recalls that Carmen's mother was just 16 when Carmen was born. So she was by herself, and then she didn't have nobody, you know, to help her to raise her baby. As she grew older, Carmen could never seem to quite catch up intellectually to other kids. She was very slow. Like, if she was nine, she acted like she was seven years old. When night fell, Carmen was besieged by nightmares. Even her mother's tender embrace was small consolation for the dark world Carmen inhabited. It was just a bad dream. Eventually, Carmen went to live with her grandparents. They became a ray of light for 10-year-old Carmen. They loved her a lot. They were very, very, very close. The three together, go up everywhere together. One of Carmen's most cherished chores was running errands for her grandfather in their central Rochester neighborhood known as Bull's Head. She did this regularly. Perhaps the wrong person noticed. On November 16, 1971, Carmen went to the pharmacy for her grandfather. Something strange happened. When her grandfather's prescription wasn't ready, Carmen blurted out, I gotta go, I gotta go, and bolted from the pharmacy. She was sent to the drugstore about 4.20 p.m. She was told it'd take a while for In the... In Virginia, Hazelwood analyzes the incident with his profiling team. They wonder whether Carmen might have been in a particular hurry that day because someone was waiting outside for her. Certainly, I guess there's no way of knowing now, but I thought the same thing has got to go. Is that related to just a general, she's in a hurry, or that specifically somebody was waiting for her outside or some reason that she had to go? But... If Carmen's eventual abductor had already made contact with her by that point and still allowed her to enter the pharmacy by herself, it would suggest they were at least acquaintances. On that fateful afternoon, Carmen Cologne would be seen one last time. She was last seen about 5.30 that same day on Route 490 West, which was about 12 miles from where her neighborhood was. One hour after Carmen ran from the pharmacy, she reappeared apparently in serious trouble and she was last seen running away from a car which was backing up on the shoulder of this road in an attempt to catch up to her dozens of cars drove past carmen as she ran from her abductor one of them was driven by jeff peters who was 25 years old at the time and subsequently reported his story to the police from cali and i were commuting from rochester to uh, batavia it was mid-december it was a tuesday and uh, we're just commuting home over 30 years later, Peters journeys back again to the chilling moment at the place where it happened. As we approached the rest area, we noticed that there was a car backing out of the rest area. And I looked over and all of a sudden exclaimed, both at the same time, it's a girl. And we were probably driving 75 miles an hour and we're gone in a, in a second. Roy Hazelwood skillfully guides Peters back to that evening hoping to jog his memory for potential clues. In your opinion, realizing this is 31 years ago, is it possible that she was waving for help? She was running, you know, as a little girl would run. She's flailing with it like this. 30 years later, Roy Hazelwood's team of profilers painstakingly analyzes the incident of Carmen's brief escape. To them, the mere fact that Carmen's abductor lost control of her, even for one moment, is highly significant. We have to assume at the time of the abduction he had control, but here he's clearly lost control. So then the question is, how did he gain control of her to begin with if he so easily lost control of her? The second point of interest is that having lost control of her, Carmen's abductor acts swiftly to reacquire her. Consider that he's backing up in the opposite direction of the traffic that's going by him. Witnesses are seeing her run, yet he's trying to recapture her. Why? What percentage of criminals would just drive away and say, forget this? Yet he needs to control her again. For what reason? Does he know or does she know him? Surely suggests she knows of him or he knows of her because he managed, as Ken said, to finesse her and get her in the car without creating a scene or being seen. If he's a total stranger, why not just at this point say, hey, this one's done bad and take off? Hazelwood begins to form a behavioral portrait of Carmen's abductor, unskilled, impulsive, unable or unwilling to let his victim escape. Two days later, two young boys were walking near the town of Churchville, some 13 miles outside Rochester when they stumbled across the body of Carmen Cologne. 
Carmen Colon's long struggle to find security in the world had ended in a frightening death. Her cousin vividly remembers. And we went to see her. I remember when they took the blanket, you know, she had some blood around the nose and she had some lift in her hair and her body was very bad and everybody was crying. As terrible as Carmen's death was, it was doubly disturbing for Rochester to learn that numerous motorists had seen Carmen fleeing from her captor on the day she died, yet not one person helped her. There was concern in the community, first of all, outraged that no one would have stopped, you know, for this young girl running on the expressway. There was horror that their children may be the next victim. Possibly in 1971, the people of Rochester could hardly conceive of evil dwelling so close to their community. In 30 years since then, that kind of evil seems to have become far more common. To be honest with you, you know, back in 1971, we thought that probably maybe she was, uh, had a mental problem. They had, somebody had let her out to go to the bathroom and she ran away. If we had stopped and gone back, we'd have probably been going over to help the people get the girl back in the car. We absolutely didn't think of anything sinister. Now that would be different. Now if you saw that, you would think something screwy going on here or sinister. But then, uh-uh. Hazelwood's team carries out the sad, essential task of analyzing Carmen's final resting place. And she wasn't placed there. I think she was dropped there. Dropped there, I yeah. agree with you. Yeah. Also notice there's no bindings of any type on the victim. I think the important thing to note on the meaning of the disposal site, the dump, is the purpose for it. It's to distance himself from the victim. He, he, he hurriedly wants to uh, separate himself physically from, the, from, this, from this decedent. And he's not concerned that she's going to be found, but uh, he, he needs to remove yeah. himself. He's uh -huh. not thinking, is she going to be found quickly? Is she going to take a long time? He simply wants to get rid of the body, and that's why we refer to it as dumping. The group pays close attention to the particular way that Carmen was strangled. The medical examination said it was manual strangulation from the front. And we know the manual is much more personal than ligature, and strangulation from the front is much more personal than strangulation from the rear. Completely unaccustomed to such horrors, Rochester spent months regaining its small town calm. But in the spring of 1973, that calm would once again be shattered as a second young girl was kidnapped from Rochester, sexually assaulted, and left lifeless in the surrounding countryside. To Rochester investigators, the links between her and Carmen Colon suggested a serial killer with a terrifying, bizarre method of choosing his young victims. In the early 1970s, most of the country's attention was focused on the turmoil and upheaval that this new decade had ushered in. People have got to know whether or not their president's a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. But for the residents of Rochester, New York, local headlines were possibly even more disturbing. The murders of three young schoolgirls abducted from city streets, sexually assaulted, and discarded in remote areas outside of town. During the ensuing three decades, a massive local investigation would fail to produce a single arrest. Undaunted, criminal profiler Roy Hazelwood has now traveled to Rochester to apply the tools of his trade to the seemingly unsolvable case. I really enjoy working on older cases, unsolved cases, or as the police call it, cold cases. Uh, why? Because the behavior does not change in that 30-year period of time. The behavior is fixed. It's fixed through autopsy report, it's fixed through crime scene photograph, crime scene sketches, and the police report. The offender or offenders may change, but certainly not the behavior. And that's what I find fascinating, is going back and actually studying the behavior. The first to fall prey to Rochester's brutal killer was 10-year-old Carmen Colon. Two days after she disappeared off a busy downtown street, her strangled body was found in a roadside ditch near the town of Churchville. Wayne County Sheriff Richard Piscotti recalled how even seasoned law enforcement officers were hit hard by the vicious child slaying. Well, sure, because, you know, a, a child basically can't fight. Uh, they can't resist physically when an individual grabs a hold of them and the officer thinks about the tragedy that's involved and psychologically what was going through that child's mind being so scared and not knowing if they're going to live or what's going to happen and that's a tremendous amount of pressure on an officer the only way that child will ever really be put to rest is if the perpetrator is brought to justice 
But in April of 1973, 17 months after the murder of Carmen Colon, fear swept through Rochester again with the savage killing of another innocent victim, Wanda Walkowitz. Hi. Like Carmen Colon, Wanda's young life was troubled. Her father was dead. Her mother was unemployed. Her mother's live-in boyfriend had a criminal record and a history of mental illness. Largely, Wanda fended for herself. When she wasn't alone, she was often embroiled in schoolyard altercations. She was known as a fighter, and if someone was bothering her, she would definitely defend herself. Nearly 30 years later, Wanda's mother chooses not to be interviewed about the loss of her daughter. Another close relative does agree to be interviewed, but only if her own identity is kept secret. She knows Wanda was lonely, but insists she was also streetwise. She definitely wouldn't go with a stranger. She wouldn't go with someone she didn't know. But something happened on April 2nd, 1973. Around 4.30, Wanda visited a neighborhood market, picking up groceries for her mother. That's the grocery store that uh, Wanda Walkowitz went to, about four blocks from her home. And she was last seen heading north on this street, Conkey Avenue, with a bag of groceries. About one hour later, a witness reported seeing Wanda a short distance from the market with groceries, hesitating at the door of a car stopped on the street. Apparently, Wanda was being tempted by something inside the car. What might have convinced her to get in? Hazelwood reports back to his team of profilers. Her mother reported that she would not accept a ride from anyone. Now, two years before her death, a man had offered her a dime for a kiss, and she ran away from him. And finally, friends of the mother have offered her rides, and she refused. Do we have any sense of whether she knew these friends of her mother? That We assume that she did. And the interesting thing that I think that you, you wonder about this, and it's hard to know with any degree of certainty, is she the kind of child who could turn down a ride offered by somebody that she slightly knows, because it's okay to say no to that person, versus someone who's a complete stranger and says, get in the car, would she turn down a ride for that person? What's certain is that later that night, a car stopped at a rest area off Route 104 near the town of Webster. The next day, a New York State trooper happened across Wanda's lifeless body at the bottom of the hillside. Postmortem indicated that this young girl had been strangled and sexually assaulted and dumped there, again in plain sight from an expressway. For Wanda's family members, her death had a permanent effect, not only of grief, but of fear for their own safety. I've always been very afraid, and I've always looked over my shoulder and not trusted people for a long time, just not knowing if that person is still out there. We don't want anyone to know who we are or anything because there is that fear of someone coming after us. For Roy Hazelwood and his team of profilers, the first order of business is comparing Wanda's murder to Carmen Colon's 18 months earlier. The similarity to the first case is clearly they're both classic examples of a dumped victim. Here, however, the obvious major difference that jumps out at you is the fact that she is more fully clothed than the previous victim. Absolutely. The cases differed in other ways as well. The method of strangulation in the Wanda Walkowitz case contrasted sharply with how Carmen Colon was killed. The strangulation by belt, how sure are they of that fact? Uh, well, that's the medical examiner's uh, opinion. The marks on the neck were consistent with a belt or similar, similar ligature and suggested that it had been applied from the rear. It was also revealed at the autopsy that Wanda Walkowitz had been fed during the time she was missing, while Carmen Colon had not. And on Wanda's clothing were found white cat hairs. Wanda's family did not own a white cat. Investigators began to theorize that Wanda may have accepted a ride from a stranger who used food and a friendly cat to make her feel comfortable. So how then did Carmen Colon's killer lure her? With two cases now before him, Hazelwood is able to begin drawing comparisons between key details. First of all, the sites were very similar, uh, both the abduction sites and the disposal sites. The abduction sites were generally comprised of lower middle to lower income socioeconomic areas, heavily trafficked at the time of the abductions. 
the disposal sites were very similar in that they were rural and they were all outside of the Rochester city limits. Another thing is we noted the disposal sites indicated no planning to us, that they were hastily disposed of in an area that was available and with which the offender could quickly dispose of the body and separate himself from the body. So we found that to be significant also. It was at this point that investigators noticed the most significant parallel between the two murders. In the first case, little attention was given to the double C initials of Carmen Colon's name. But with the murder of Wanda Walkowitz, detectives and the public wondered if Rochester's young girls were being stalked by a killer obsessed with names bearing twin initials. But eerily, there was even more to that theory. Carmen Colon's body was dumped in Churchville, while Wanda Walkowitz was dumped in Webster. Three C's and three W's. People began to recognize that there were similarities with the initials and that the second victim having been Wanda Wolkowitz, that her body was found in Webster, New York. And people began to talk amongst themselves. And then, of course, the media picked it up as well that there may be an issue here. There may be some connection that the two girls who had disappeared had similar initials. Whether or not the killings of the two girls were connected, there was little doubt among Rochester residents that their streets were no longer safe for their children. There were people interviewed, many of them, who said, you know, this neighborhood is simply too dangerous now. We won't let the kids go out unless we're there to watch them. And there were others who said, it is so dangerous that even though we've lived here for a long time, we're going to move. It was shortly after 10 this morning, almost 24 hours after the body of Wanda Walkowitz was found, when the state police helicopter appeared out of overcast skies. As helicopters circled the gray skies over Wanda Walkowitz's final resting place, Rochester could only hope that with the coming of summer, its nightmare would finally end. Can you think of anything that might have happened recently that would have brought her to the breaking point, made her want to run away from home? No, nothing. But before the year was out, Rochester police would search the streets again for any clue to the disappearance of yet another young girl with matching initials. We were trying to find out whether she could have had a problem at home and uh, give her a reason to take off. But uh, we're not overlooking the fact that maybe something else could have happened to this young girl. By the fall of 1973, in Rochester, New York, the murder of Wanda Walkowitz and the disposal of her lifeless body in the nearby town of Webster had provoked a massive investigation and not a single arrest. I think the important thing is that we're re-enkindling uh, the interest in this case because someone out there must know something. And what we're trying to do is bring that person or persons forward regardless of what information they have. The words, it happened again, highlighted the worst aspect of the story. The fact that 17 months earlier, a girl named Carmen Cologne had also been sexually assaulted and strangled, and her body disposed of in a town called Churchville. Out there, somebody knows something. Let them come to us and give us information if they want to remain a, a secret. The Rochester community grappled with the thought that for some perverse reason, the killer might be targeting girls with matching first and last initials, then discarding their bodies in remote towns that began with the same initial. In order to select victims based on their initials, you have to do a lot of homework. You've got to do a lot of intelligence gathering. You've got to have a specific age that you're interested in. You've got to have a specific area. You've got to have access to something that tells you the initials of the victim. So that indicates time and patience and planning. Worse yet, the killer seemed to be aiming his vicious skills at girls with the least hope of defending themselves. Girls from poor families with few friends. And then, six months after Wanda Walkowitz died, it happened again. Her name was Michelle Mayenza. Like Carmen Cologne and Wanda Walkowitz, she could never quite fit in with her classmates. They teased her mercilessly. They've been upsetting you again. On the Monday after Thanksgiving in 1973, Michelle visited the school nurse's office in tears. They wouldn't let me put hands on me. Michelle calmed down, and the nurse let her leave. She was supposed to go to the market for her mother. Witnesses later reported seeing her en route to the market. Then she vanished. Police combed Michelle's neighborhood for clues. How could another girl have vanished without a single eyewitness to say what happened? We're trying to find out whether she has any emotional problems, 
whether she could have had a problem at home and uh, give her a reason to take off. That's a possibility, but uh, we're not overlooking the fact that maybe something else could have happened to this young girl. Investigators got a potential break in the case when a woman called saying she might have seen Michelle at a hamburger stand in a man's car. The witness saw a child resembling Michelle in the suspect's car looking straight ahead. The suspect, a man with dirty hands, returned to the car carrying a bag and a cup. She was described by relatives as being naive, trusting, friendly, shy, and easily frightened. At their headquarters in Manassas, Virginia, Roy Hazelwood and his Academy Group colleagues assessed the personality traits that might have put Michelle at risk. One of her relatives said she may have been responsive to a person who paid attention to her. I think that's important uh, as, as her personality and victimology. Given her stature and she was upset at school and others call her names, if someone is very friendly or is very nice to her, she may be responsive to that type of attention. Two days after Michelle disappeared, Gene Vandewald was driving on a country road outside Rochester when something caught his eye. When I drove by, I seen something laying along the road, so I got out of the truck to see what it was, and I saw it was a girl laying here. The girl was Michelle Mayenza. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled. For the third time in two years, authorities faced the daunting task of informing a family of the loss of their child. Michelle's brother, Steve, uh, remembers their reaction. Devastating. She was a very nice person. I just wish she could be still with us today. Just couldn't put into words what could have been if she was still alive. Michelle's murder closely paralleled that of Wanda Walkowitz. Both were strangled with a ligature, probably a belt or a rope, and both were left clothed by their murderer. Carmen Cologne, on the other hand, was strangled by hand, and she was mostly naked when her body was found. But in one key detail, the third murder was identical to the first two. It was in the matching initials of the victim's name, Michelle Mayenza, and the fact that her final resting place bore the same first initial, Macedon. The alphabet killer, it seemed, had struck again. Now, Captain, what do you make of this case so far? Are you convinced that it was the same man who killed Carmen Cologne and Wanda Wolkowitz? Uh, I'm not convinced, but I strongly suspect that uh, we're looking for the same person. The woman who told police she might have seen Michelle Mayenza at the hamburger stand, accompanied by a man with dirty hands, later provided police with their first full description of a possible suspect. But for Roy Hazelwood and his colleagues at the Academy Group, the sighting of Michelle at the hamburger stand is significant for very different reasons. That obviously is extremely important. If you're talking about someone who abducts a child and now we're going to take time to eat, this is some significant behavior. So whether it's an ice cream cone or a hamburger, the fact that he paused for whatever it was, five minutes, 30 minutes, an hour to eat is really significant behavior. We know what happened with victim one. We know she's running away and the car is backing up and he's going after her. now. After you capture her, are you thinking, well, I need to get her fed? Or are you thinking, I need to dispose of this person, get rid of this body, as opposed to victims two and three who are apparently fed based on stomach contents? For Hazelwood, this fact that two of the victims, Michelle and Wanda, were apparently fed before being murdered provides an important glimpse into their killer's emotions. He fed them in an effort to, quote, take care of them while they were with him. That showed a closeness to them between he and the victim. Not a relational closeness, but an emotional closeness. But Hazelwood's colleagues disagree. They suggest a colder, more calculating motive for the killer to have fed his intended victim. The part about feeding them, you wonder, is that a remorse thing? Is that some feeling for the child? Or is it a control mechanism? Now, if he's convinced them that he's their friend, let's say that's the lure that he used, oh, you want to go get some ice cream with me? Well, now, as soon as you're not going towards the ice cream parlor, then that child is going to suspect there's something wrong. But if you go to the ice cream parlor, if you go to the McDonald's, get the hamburger, that reassures this victim. And so it may be that the giving him the food was more of a control mechanism. They saw a vehicle parked on the wrong side of the road facing south. Back in Rochester, Wayne County Sheriff open. Richard Piscotti escorts Hazelwood and crime location analyst Kim Rossmo to the site near the town of Macedon where Michelle's body was found. While the killer chose to deposit her body in plain sight, he clearly had other options. 
We've got a culvert over here, water yes. running through it. Was that in place in 1973? Yes, that culvert was here. This would certainly be a much more concealed area to dispose of the body in. The, the water would have uh, speeded up decay, and there, at least on the other side, actual a tunnel that you could have placed the body in, especially a child's body. Well, it suggests lack of local area knowledge uh, in terms of his familiarity with all the different ways he could have gotten rid of a body. He didn't pick the best. With the addition of each shred of information, Hazelwood's profile of the alphabet killer emerges more clearly. Ultimately, it will be as surprising and controversial as the murders themselves. As the 1970s wound to a close, Rochester, New York investigators were no closer to arresting a suspect in the alphabet murders than when the first girl was abducted, sexually assaulted, and strangled eight years earlier. But in 1979, the most promising suspect yet emerged. For two years, the Los Angeles area had lived in terror as the Hillside Strangler sexually assaulted and murdered 13 women leaving their bodies on brushy, often garbage-strewn embankments. When police finally made an arrest, it was soon discovered that the suspect, Kenneth Bianchi, was from Rochester and had lived there at the time of the alphabet killings. Well, of course, when you talk about the man who confessed to being the hillside strangler, the fact that this guy was born here and lived here during the time of these killings certainly was inevitably going to lead to some question about could he be involved. Bianchi's victims were almost exclusively adult women. On the other hand, Rochester's victims were three grade school girls. In Roy Hazelwood's experience, sexual predators targeting different age groups are an especially rare breed. Those are not as common as the individuals who are age specific. For example, small children, prepubescent children, or the elderly, or age mates. So it's not common for an individual to begin with a very young child and move on to an adult woman. Indeed, a palm print discovered on Michelle Mayenza's body ultimately led Rochester police to eliminate Kenneth Bianchi as the alphabet killer. As for other physical evidence, there is still a chance that DNA testing could play a role in solving this case. Recently, a semen-stained undergarment from one of the Rochester victims was submitted for advanced DNA analysis. If technicians are able to isolate DNA from the sample, they will possess a genetic fingerprint of the killer, which police can then compare with the DNA of possible suspects. The big question, after 30 years, is the DNA from that undergarment still viable? One of the really valuable uh, characteristics uh, of the DNA and DNA technology is the ability of the DNA molecule under the right conditions to last indefinitely. It's a remarkably hardy little molecule. The recent development of what is called short tandem repeat DNA technology means that even extremely old biological evidence may still yield valuable information. Even if a sample is somewhat decomposed, we can still come up with great results. Ten years ago, almost any degradation resulted in no results at all. But what Roy Hazelwood and his team have done is assemble and compare all the evidence, physical and behavioral, from the three slaves to create a profile of the killer. They now must determine whether the behavior of their killer is consistent with a commonly held theory of a killer who selected and disposed of his victims on the basis of matching initials. What are the odds of three victims, 10, 11, 11, being raped and murdered, abducted from the same area and having the same initials? I'm studying the behavior, and I just don't know how the guy who committed this crime could be obsessed with kidnapping girls who had two initials that are the same. Well, let's consider that he did. That he has to identify women with the, or young girls with the same first and last initials, OK? But what does that say about him? It says that's an element of planning. That's an element of surveillance. It's a level of organization. And, and we don't see that anywhere else in the crimes. All in all, Hazelwood and his colleagues don't see the behavior they would expect from what might be called an alphabet killer. In fact, they don't even see that the killings were necessarily committed by the same individual. We found significant dissimilarities in the three homicides. And one of the things that's very important is how did he leave them? 
And in the case of Carmen Cologne, of course, she was left almost totally nude. Wanda Walkowitz, on the other hand, was found fully clothed. And Michelle Mienza was found fully clothed. So in the last two cases, either the offender redressed the victim or he allowed the victim to redress prior to the disposal. Number two, the sexual assault against Carmen Cologne was much more physically violent than the sexual assault against either Wanda Walkowitz or Michelle Mienza. Number three, we had evidence that the victim in the last two cases, Wanda Walkowitz and Michelle Mienza, had been fed prior to their deaths by the offender. There's no such evidence of that existing in the first murder. With the single alphabet killer theory rapidly crumbling and Hazelwood's profile taking shape, police begin reopening their files and find an old suspect suddenly demanding new attention. 30 years have passed since Rochester, New York watched helplessly as three of its young girls were kidnapped, sexually assaulted, and murdered. Almost every suspect developed by investigators has eventually been eliminated. But there is one suspect who has never been officially cleared. Since Carmen Cologne's 1971 murder, Investigators had suspected that one of Carmen's own uncles, Miguel Colon, might be responsible for her death. There was an uncle who um, was very highly suspect in this case, mostly through circumstance, in that he did not have a good alibi. When they did want to interview him, they couldn't find him anywhere. He kept eluding investigators. Carmen's cousin, Angel Colon, insists Miguel could not have committed such an act. My uncle, he loved her a lot, and he also, he grew up with her too, you know what I mean? And he cried, he suffered when that, when that happened. He suffered twice, but the police took him as a, uh, like a suspicion, you know what I mean? And, but my uncle, is, he never did nothing like that. Rochester police kept pursuing Miguel Colon for questioning. In 1991, they finally tracked him down. But as they closed in, Miguel Colon pulled out a gun and committed suicide. In their ongoing efforts to confirm or eliminate Cologne as a suspect, Rochester police will now be able to compare him to Roy Hazelwood's profile of Carmen Cologne's killer. Accompanied by geographical profiler Kim Rosmo, Hazelwood returns to Rochester to share the results of his investigation with Wayne County Sheriff Richard Piscotti. Hazelwood drops his first bombshell. The evidence has convinced him that the three slayings were most probably the work of two different killers. Therefore, he's delivering two distinct profiles, one for the man who killed Carmen Cologne, and a second for the murderer of Wanda Walkowitz and Michelle Mienza. Based on his exhaustive experience and study of violent sexual predators, Hazelwood believes that Carmen Cologne's killer probably knew her. In Hazelwood's estimation, the killer was probably 25 to 30 years old, of low to average intelligence, and most likely abused alcohol. Lastly, he had an explosive temper that led him to act impulsively. In uh, Carmen Cologne's case, you have manual strangulation, hands-on strangulation. In Wanda Walkowitz and Michelle Mienza, you have ligature strangulation. It becomes more and more apparent the longer I'm involved in this case that the first murder took place out of anger, anger toward Carmen Cologne. And the last two murders were more what we call in the behavioral sciences as a functional type of murder. This child, this person must be killed because of the danger to me as the offender. Hazelwood's profile will help Rochester police to better evaluate Miguel Colon as a suspect. Police also await contributions from any outsiders that might help link Miguel Colon to Carmen Colon's mournful death. Unlike Carmen's murderer, Hazelwood believes the man who killed Wanda and Michelle was of average intelligence, and Hazelwood believes he may have been arrested previously for lesser sexual offenses. If he had an arrest history, we believe it would have been for what uh, is commonly called nuisance type of offenses, such as obscene phone calls, window peeping, exhibitionism, and this may have come to the attention of law enforcement. Most importantly, this killer may have felt a form of respect for his young victims, as evidenced by the strange fact that Wanda and Michelle were dressed or allowed to redress before they were put to death. We believe that the murderer of Wanda and Michelle 
allowed them to redress because he wanted to leave them with dignity. He did not want to leave them grossly exposed either to the elements or to those who found them. Hazelwood now turns his attention to the question of an alphabet killer. Next area, let's address if, uh, if you agree, twin initials. All three victims, were they selected because of their twin initials, CCWWMM? It was our opinion, after sitting down and studying this, that the twin initials had nothing to do with the victim selection in this case, in these cases. So you're saying it was more spontaneous? Impulsive, absolutely yeah. impulsive. These victims were selected because of their vulnerability, because of their availability, possibly because of their age, and because of their gender. Those are the four reasons these poor little victims were selected. Piscotti's response is exactly what Hazelwood had hoped to hear, that his profiles of the Rochester killers have brought local authorities much closer to finally solving the case. To be very honest with you, I feel you have narrowed the investigation immensely. Sometimes we get into a case where we have tunnel vision. We tried not to do that in this case, but we have experts now that have taken an outside look and they've given me some hope in this investigation. There is an individual that comes to my mind that we've got to take a harder look at, and I would give nothing more than to see a closure to this case that put these little girls to rest, as they should be. Although nearly 30 years have passed since the murders of Carmen Colon, Wanda Walkowitz, and Michelle Mayenza, their deaths have not been forgotten. In fact, one of the little girls has apparently been cared for in a unique way. It seems that for nearly 15 years after the murder of Wanda Walkowitz, family members who went to visit her grave found that a visitor had already been there. When they went to visit her grave site, they found that someone had cleared off her gravestone, had cleaned it, and had placed flowers there. And that this continued for a number of years. This went on for about 15 years. No one in our family had left the flowers. You know, we contacted everyone, even our relatives that lived out of state and no one ever did that. So for a long time, someone was maintaining the grave. I think there's one way to look at it that perhaps the guilty person is suffering from some degree of remorse. For the families of Rochester's victims, and for nearly any human being, the emotions and motives of a child killer are impossible to fathom. But Roy Hazelwood has embraced that challenge. With his team of profilers, he has attempted to enter the darkness where the killers of three little girls live to bring forth the warm light of healing and the sharp light of justice. Hazelwood's vast experience tells him that the deaths of Carmen, Wanda, and Michelle will one day be solved. With the public's help, three school children in Rochester will one day rest in peace, and Rochester's long nightmare will fight end.